And I pray that each one of us would walk by love and that we would really experience the love of Christ, not only today but throughout this week, and that as you celebrate Valentine's Day this, this coming week, my hope and prayer is that um, that love would not just be the flowers and the roses and the perfume, whatever you, the ladies get and the guys get, whatever, I don't know if guys get roses but, um, <laughs> or perfume, but maybe they get cologne or I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to put my foot in it. But whatever it is, remember the greatest love of all is the love that you can experience that Jesus Christ gives to us. Why don't you pray with me as we go into God's Word this morning. Father, thank you that we can love you and serve you. And this morning, Father, I thank you that we can um, just experience, Lord, your presence with us today. We ask you that you would speak to us through the word this morning. Teach us your ways, transform our lives, and that we'd become everything you want us to be. So, Lord, we give this time into your hand. Open up our hearts and our minds. And, Lord, nourish us and teach us your ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we... I want to talk about this wonderful thing called the, the gift of peace. Um, God has given us this gift, at least Jesus said. He said something in our passage, and we're going to be reading that in just a moment. As we find, and if you want, you can turn into your Bibles to John chapter 14, verse 21 through 31. In this passage, John speaks a lot about the love that he has for us that He has given to each one of us, and the love that He has for His children. We find that being loved... By the Father, there's a contingency that goes along with that, and that is that we obey His commandments. And we've touched on this numerous times over the last several weeks, about our obedience and about following the love of God. We must note that obedience to the commandments is not the cause just simply that the Father loves us. It's not the cause that generates salvation. But Jesus said, if we love Him, we will keep His commandments. It's not that we keep His commandments and thereby love Him. It's as we love Him, then we keep His commands. Because we want to please Him. We want to be in that right standing with Him. No one could keep the law perfectly. There was not one person other than Jesus Christ. He was the only one that was able to keep the law of God and apply the law of God and live by the law of God. And our obedience to the commandments of the Lord are inevitable results of our salvation. There's no way that you and I would want to keep God's law if we're not saved. In other words, if you've never been born again, if you don't have a living relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not part of your psyche to do the things that God wants you to do. You would rather do the things that you want to do, that the world would want you to do, other than what Jesus Christ wants you to do. And unfortunately, there's many quote-unquote believers that do their own thing rather than following the teachings of God's Word. In other words, we don't really understand what God's Word is all about, and we're not making the Word of God applicable. Obedience to God flows out of a heart, out of our hearts, that are transformed by the power of God the Holy Spirit in us. You see, when you are born again and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you, and He changes you. You are born again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus, remember? You must be born again. You must be born again spiritually. And that's for each and every single person upon the face of the earth. To experience that transformation only happens when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The only way then you, can, you and I can find God's love is as we experience that love in our lives. I don't know what's going on back there, but thanks, Bob. Obedience is the trademark that shows that one truly loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And without that, without that obedience, how do people actually know that we love God? If you just continue in being just like everyone else. How is that even possible? There has to be something that is transformational in our lives. We read in, in 1 Corinthians, at least in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, that our lives are changed. By the power of God. We become new creatures. The old has passed away and everything becomes new in our lives. And has that new actually occurred in our lives? Has everything become new in your life because of your love for the Lord Jesus Christ? The question is, Lord, and, and, the, and, and, and as we read this passage from John, and, it's, and it's, it's a rather lengthy passage, but Judas comes to him and he asks this question. Now the Judas that we're talking about is not Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. This is another Judas. And he asks 
this, this particular question. He says, Lord, why are, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Now think about that for a moment. That, that's kind of a weird question because didn't Jesus come for the world at large? Wasn't he going to reveal himself to everyone? And so Judas poses this question. He says, but Lord, why are you just going to reveal yourself to us and not at the world at large? Remember that Jesus had been rejected by his own people. He came for his people, but his people rejected him. They didn't accept him to be the Messiah. And so he couldn't manifest himself how he desired to, to them because of their rejection of him. And imagine just for a moment, in fact, that if Christ were to manifest himself to every single human being upon the face of the earth in such a dramatic way that uh, with, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, you could not doubt the Lord Jesus Christ, then we would stand without excuse. No person would then have an excuse. And because of that, then judgment would have to occur immediately when we reject him. But because of his great love and his mercy, now, and I believe this is why John penned these words in the words of the Lord, but because of his great love, that manifestation has been manifested to the body of Christ, has been manifested to the church, that you and I then could be the living representatives of Jesus Christ in the world, that people would see you and I and see Jesus and thereby be drawn to him. I've met Christians, and I'm sure you have in the past, that if you would say that that's a, a picture of what a believer and a follower of Jesus is like, you really didn't want to be one. And I remember there were times when I met people like that, and I thought, yikes. I was a believer at that time, and I thought, boy, oh boy, I wish they would just fall in love with Jesus. Because they became law-bound, and it was just heavy, heavy-duty stuff. And, and they would look down their noses at you and say, what kind of a Christian are you? You're struggling in your walk. Not realizing that it's only because of grace, and only because of mercy, and only because of His great love that we are saved. And that we can then share that great love and mercy. You see, Jesus him revealed himself to the church and left the church in the world to be the witness of God's love. And how, what kind of witness are we of Christ's love? And some of us that are here this morning, I pray that we would become such a dynamic witness of God's love rather than being con condemning of the world. Jesus Christ loved the world so much. The Father loved the world so much. We know that scripture. John 3.16, we quote it all the time, that he sent Jesus Christ. Instead of coming down and telling people that they need to clean up their act and get their act right, why don't we get our act right and stop being so condemning? That's the church at large, and I've met people like that. You've met them. The church should be the most loving place that a person could ever find themselves part of. When we walk in this room today, we should experience love that is beyond comparison. Now, I wonder how many of you experienced that this morning. Angela, you said you did. But we need to be like that. Experiencing God's love. Overwhelming love. When we hug one another, it's because we love that person. Because of the love of Christ that's inside of us. Now, I'm not saying you're not doing that. But there's always room for improvement. There's room for improvement in any church. And there's room, in, room for that improvement right here. You see, Jesus is patiently waiting and still giving lost sinners the opportunity to come and discover him and fall in love with him for themselves. In, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, we find, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is what God's desire is. That's why he's patient with us. That's why he has, hasn't manifested himself powerfully and, and, and so dynamically that, that people would tremble and fall at his feet. He wants people to fall in love with him because of who he is. A loving God. One that cares for us. And then he, Peter continues writing, But the day of the Lord will come. And he, look at the change here. He talks about the love of God, but he says, But don't just negate this. But there will come a day. And it will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in, done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. But keep... But, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness 
dwells. Then he says, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We must come to the place where we are at peace with him. Now, when you and I read a passage like that, we go like, yikes, it's going to be bad one day. It is. But it's going to be bad for everyone. Not, not just for the unbeliever, but for the believer, because we see the pain and suffering that the non-believer will be going through. And our hearts break. When we meet people that don't know Jesus, doesn't your heart break and yearn for them to, that they too would fall in love with Jesus? Or do you just write them off and say, well, they're going to a lost eternity? If that's the case, ask God to change your heart. That you would look at them with eyes, with the eyes of Christ. That you would look at them with love and compassion and mercy. And reach out to them and say, listen, Jesus loves you and so do I. And, we, and I'm not perfect, but neither are you. And we, and we must understand that in each one of our lives. The passage that we just read is scary at first. But there's a way that you and I can ease a troubled mind. There's a way that we can find peace with God. And that's what Jesus spoke about in our passage, is that we can discover His peace transforming our lives. There may be times that you feel like an orphan. You feel all left alone. You feel unloved. It's like everyone's forgotten about you. What's the use of even going on? You feel like everyone's pushing in on you. And that's the time that you and I must let God the Holy Spirit his Spirit come and fill you with God's love. That you and I can experience His presence in our lives and that transforms us as our hearts become pliable to God. And when you feel like lonely like that, when you feel abandoned, when you feel distraught, when you feel like your world is falling and crumbling around you, that's the time to be quiet and just come into the presence of Jesus. That's the time to let His Spirit just envelop you and let Him fill you from the sole of your feet to the crown of your head. That's when you experience the true peace of God. We needn't fret. We don't have to worry. Jesus said that right in the beginning of John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. So we mustn't be troubled. We're not to be anxious. We're not to be worried. Spurgeon once said, Little faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Isn't that number great? When we, the more faith we have in God, the more we experience God's presence in our lives, the more we can be changed in our lives, because heaven is not something far away. God establishes His kingdom right, right now in our hearts, that your life and my life can be changed by His presence. That's the amazing thing that we have with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our hearts can experience heaven on earth even in the midst of the most hazardous times that we live in. Jesus is there, and we can come to Him by obeying Him and worshiping and declaring His majesty and telling people how amazing He is. The problem in the world today isn't that many people, um, is, is that people don't have that kind of relationship. They don't know God because God seems so distant. And perhaps they haven't even thought about God recently. And that's where you and I come in, that we, you and I can tell people about the majesty and how glorious God is. And in the turmoil, in the public arena, and maybe the turmoil that you're facing in your own life, and the turmoil that we face in the world every single day, that's not of God. Because Jesus said, I'm going to give you and I'm going to leave you with peace. The peace that I give, I give you this peace not as the world gives. It's a different kind of peace. And it comes to us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. So this peace comes from Jesus himself. He said, I'm going to give you this. Not only was he telling the disciples that, but he's telling that to each one of us that are in the room today. That we can experience tremendous peace. And it's not a worldly peace. It's not a circumstantial peace. It's not a peace on the external of our lives. It's a peace that comes from Him. And He says it is a gift. In other words, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. Jesus said, here it is. I'm giving you this gift. And so then He again emphasizes, and so don't be troubled and don't be afraid. Both in the Old and the New Testament, we understand and we come and we, we discover this amazing peace. Because the Old Testament talks about peace, but so does Jesus. 
And we speak, and we, as we find this, that one of the most profound statements and the words that is used throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, is that word shalom, which oftentimes has also been used as a greeting. In, in, in many Jewish families, they would walk and they would greet one another in shalom, or as they would depart, they would say shalom, which is peace. It's a Hebrew word for peace. But what is this particular word? What's it all about? What does it mean to us? In the Old Testament, it occurs approximately 250 times. And so it's pretty important when we find about the peace of God. And as it's been used as a greeting, it's more than just a greeting, though. It's something internalized. It's something that, that, that is very precious. Not only is it precious to Jewish people, but it's precious to you and I. Because it speaks of peace, but it's a peace that comes from Jesus Christ. It's, it's this gift that Jesus was talking about. It means wholeness. It means completeness. It means health. It means security. It may even mean prosperity because of the peace that God gives us. You see, when we're enjoying God's peace, there is joy. There is contentment that comes from knowing the peace of God. It comes from knowing and experiencing the very presence of Jesus through us being born again. And so in modern Hebrew, that word shalom often meant the absence of strife or the absence of war, because oftentimes they would be at war. But it also meant that there's a harmony between God and man, that there's a harmony between God and people. And that's what God is looking at in our lives. He wants that harmony in our lives between Him and us. And it is a gift that Jesus Christ has given to us. And so in the latter sense, the hallmark of Christ's kingdom, or the mark of His kingdom, is that there will be peace. You know that there's probably never been a time in the world when there's absolutely been peace. No more the peace than in maybe in 50 years. The world is constantly at war with one another. But when Jesus Christ comes, there will be harmony. There will be peace. Isaiah said in chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. What a glorious day that the prophet wrote about here, that he spoke about. He was talking about that messianic kingdom. And he says, many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God, the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. That's when Jesus Christ at his second coming comes and sets up the kingdom. This is what the prophets saw when the messianic kingdom is established, when Jesus will be established on the throne of David. But in the meantime, we can have internal peace. Now, this will be a physical peace where there won't be war because Jesus is ruling and he is the author of peace. It says of his kingdom there will be no end. We read that in Isaiah chapter 9. And we see that, how wonderful and how marvelous that is. Until that time, however, strife and turmoil will continue on earth. Until Jesus Christ comes again, turmoil and strife is, is par for the course. It's just part of life. And so if you ever think that there's ever going to be a utopian society where there is peace, it's not going to happen until Jesus Christ comes again. We can hope for it, but that's like hoping for hope. It's just an empty hope. There will only come hope when Christ comes again in His second coming. Unsafe people enjoy for a, for, for a season. And their peace is really the absence of strife. And so when, when, other, when there's no fighting going on, then when there's no arguments between people and everything's that harmonious at work, then there's peace. But the moment someone steps out of line and or displeases you, strife and turmoil occur. Christians enjoy peace in spite of trials and turmoil, in spite of difficulties, because we have the promise that Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans, but I will send another who's just like me, the paraclete, the one, the comforter. Remember we spoke about him last week about the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. If you weren't here last week, go online. You can listen to it or you can watch it. And you can find out about the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and what He does in our lives and transforms us. Biblical peace doesn't depend upon circumstances. It doesn't depend upon what's going on around us. Biblical peace comes from the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in our lives. You see, we live above 
the circumstances in our lives because it's not dependent simply upon what's going on. We rise above that because we have God the Holy Spirit living within us and He transforms our lives. He's the one that does a dynamic work in our lives. The tranquil state of the soul, someone wrote in a lexicon defining peace. He said, the tranquil state of the soul is assured of its salvation through Christ and fearing nothing from God, content with its earthly lot, whatsoever that sort may be. So no matter what goes on in our lives, this definition is that we have the peace of God that surpasses natural understanding. And if you don't have peace right now, it's probably because we're not connected with God right now. But God wants to connect with you. He wants to connect with each one of us. He wants to give each one of us His supernatural peace that comes from His presence, that comes from the Holy Spirit living deep down in our hearts. And the Apostle Paul aptly expressed it when he wrote to the believers in Philippi and he said these words, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, every, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I wonder if we could echo these words with the Apostle Paul. That no matter what comes down the pike, whether in want or, or whether we, we've got lots or whether we've got nothing, can we be content? Can we have peace in all circumstances? Obviously, Paul can. And I do believe that if that were not the case, we wouldn't have these scriptures. But we can have peace. The problem is that we fret. I know I do. I get anxious. I start worrying. And I'm thinking, oh, what's going to happen? And I've got to catch myself. I've got to arrest that because otherwise it'll do a number on me. And I've got to say, no, I'm not going to go down this path because Jesus, you said that you have given me your peace. And sometimes Sharon says, let's, let's, let's really stop for a moment and let's let the peace of God flood our hearts. And we have to do that, not just once or twice, all the time, because the enemy in the world presses in, in our lives and it r ruffles our feathers and we got, get bent out of shape. God wants to do something amazing in our lives. And he wants that peace to be part and parcel of our lives. Jesus said, this peace I give you, it comes from him. It's not a worldly peace. It's not a worldly generated peace. Paul remained content and at peace in the middle of the most adverse circumstances, when he was incarcerated, when he was shipwrecked, when he was stoned, when he was thrown in jail, all these things, and yet Paul had peace. Oh, Lord, make me a little more like Paul, that I can have your peace in all circumstances. Jesus tells us that we can have that peace. Christians, it's you and I that are called by his name and that have de decided to become followers of his. You can experience the peace of God. Regardless of what you face in the world, regardless of how gloomy it may seem, that peace of God can be your portion, can be my portion, can be our portion as a community of faith, can be the portion of East Rockway Nazarene. We can have tremendous peace. Not only can we experience the love of God in here, but when we walk in, there's something about it when we gather in His name. Whether the music is loud, whether it's worshipful or soft, there's something about the presence of Jesus and it brings about a peace. There's that worship and the adoration of who Jesus is. Because it's something internal that God generates in our lives. The Holy Spirit uses the Bible, uses this word of God to bring about peace. He gives us this peace and we read about it in the Bible. The world bases its peace on its resources. God's peace depends on our relationship with Him. On our relationships one with another. How do we love one another? You see, to be right with God means to, again, enjoy the very peace of God. When we're not right with God, we're not experiencing His peace. To be right with Him, you will experience peace. I guarantee it. You see, the world depends upon personal ability, but the believer depends on our spiritual adequacy. Are we right with Christ? Do we really trust Him with everything in our lives? Do we, are we totally dependent upon Him? Does He fill our hearts? Does He fill our lives? Are we always in His presence? In the world, peace is something that you can hope for, that you can maybe work for and maybe perhaps attain. But for the believer, peace is God's wonderful gift that is received and placed in your heart by faith. See how important it is to believe, 
to believe the word of God, to believe the promises of God. When we really believe and not doubt, then the peace of God has a place to establish itself. In the truest sense, real peace can never be found in the world. You and I can never find peace in the world. If you're looking for peace in this world, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Godless people in a godless world by nature are the enemies of God and therefore are in a state of constant turmoil because they had loggerheads with God. And yet God is still patient with them. God is still loving on them. God is still revealing himself to them, making a way possible that every single person can come and discover his amazing peace, that they can discover who Jesus Christ is and that their lives can be changed. The Bible re repeatedly emphasizes that the world's peace is totally inadequate. Where just when you think you got peace, you get a blowout on your tire, you hit a puddle, and boom, the rim is bent, and now what? Peace is gone. Well, but it's circumstantial. You say, well, thank God that I hit the puddle, now I can get a new rim and a new tire. <laughs> that tire was all worn out. It's how we look at a circumstance, right? And on these people in the church today that can testify to that. About what God did. And if Andy was here, he'd get up and he'd say, man, I thank God for Hurricane Sandy. I've got a brand new house out of it. Up on stilts. Manny over here, he, he can testify to the same thing. He was telling us in the men, men's group yesterday. What God does, he takes... You know, it's a cliche, but he takes lemons and he makes lemonade for us because that's the nature of God. He is so loving. He's so gracious to us, and he wants to give you his peace in all circumstances. Not to worry, not to become anxious, not to fret, not to, not to panic, but just to trust him with his peace. Isaiah says that there is no peace for the wicked. Yikes. So when we're not in, in tune with God, there's no peace for us. He also says, and Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 17, that the way of peace, this is for unbelievers, they do not know. So when you meet a person that doesn't know Jesus, they really don't know peace. Yes, they may be satisfied in financials or whatever it might be, but real deep inner peace is always missing. I've met people who are dirt poor, but they have such a peace because they know Jesus. But I've also met the ones who are, to are totally loaded, and they have peace because they know Jesus. It's not dependent, again, on circumstances. It's something that's dependent deep down inside. It's that relationship. And that's what God is interested in, is our relationship with Him. In Thessalonians, Paul wrote describing the end times, and he said that people were searching for peace. And he says these words in 1 Thessalonians, While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Just when, and, and the, the world, be, be aware of that, there, there may come a time where there seems to be peace, and, and Daniel writes about this. There, there will be a time of peace prior to the Lord's coming. But in the middle of that, the peace treaty and everything will be broken down, and all hell will break loose. And so just when the world says, oh, peace, 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 be careful. Because only real peace can come from Jesus himself. And it's only when Christ comes again that real peace externally will also happen. The peace that the world gives is only temporary. There is only one source of true peace. Guess where that source is? It's Jesus. There is no other source. It is Christ's peace. And the peace that Jesus promised to us is manifest in our lives by God the Holy Spirit. He is the one that transforms us. He is the one that gives us His peace. He is the one that does a heart change. He does a life transformation in our lives. Imagine that setting in, the, in that upper room. So Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. He's just told them he's going to be leaving them soon. And they start fretting. They start worrying. Now what, Lord? I thought you were going to come and establish the kingdom. I thought you were going to become the ruler. He's, you're going to deliver us from Rome. Now you're telling us you're leaving. And then Jesus saw that, remember? And he said, well, don't worry, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving you, but I'm going to send another who's just like me, the Holy Spirit. And he will teach you all things, remind you of all things that I've told you. I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be with you always. And in their broken heart,